Good afternoon. Uh, it's great to see everybody here. I'm Mike Lignati, a rector and president of CU. We welcome faculty, <coughs> staff, and students to this uh, uh, lecture, which is part of a series. I'm going to introduce our distinguished speaker, but first I'd like to ask uh, Reinhard Betsuga of the School of Public Policy uh, and ask him to introduce the series. Thank SPP Martin Kahanek for uh, his leadership. Uh, let's introduce, also, why don't you introduce the series first, and then I'll introduce. Introduce the Fine, the all right, yeah. I'll do everything. That's Fine. the most, most um, important. Reinhard Betsuga put together a series of lectures um, <coughs> enabling ambassadors from a range of countries uh, to present their vision of the national dream of particular countries. Uh, as you know, ac academically, we study nations, nationalism, national identities uh, in all of our classes, um, but it's a, a good thing that we have a, a public forum in which a representative from a range of countries can present their vision of their country and uh, the size of the audience indicates you're pretty interested in this particular country uh, that's going to be talking tonight. I want to uh, introduce uh, David Kornstein, Ambassador Kornstein, uh, who arrived in Budapest as the new ambassador of the United States in Hungary. Within four days of his arrival in Budapest, he came and paid us a visit. It's a very important thing for an American ambassador to do, to indicate that this is an institution that's proud of its accreditation in the United States. It's proud that it has been part of a kind of bridge between Hungary and the United States through various regimes, various governments for 25 years. And uh, he was uh, here. We gave him a tour of the buildings. I think he liked what he saw. Um, and uh, he is since his visit uh, in every public platform, in every interview, uh, affirmed the commitment, not only his personal commitment, but the commitment of the government of the United States that this institution, this free institution, this example of uh, American academic life at its best and at its freest should remain in Budapest. And um, he has had, I think it's, a matter of public record, so I can say it. He's had meetings with the Prime Minister of Hungary on this issue. Uh, and since those meetings has uh, been facilitating discussions with the government of Hungary to try and find a solution to what we like to call around here our little local difficulty. <laughs> um, and our little local difficulty little is to secure a stable, long-term, legal basis to continue to operate here as a free institution, awarding US accredited degrees and our uh, Hungarian accredited degrees in one unified place called CU. Uh, we are, the discussions that uh, Ambassador Kornstein has made possible are still ongoing. And uh, they remain the best and possibly the last chance that we have to uh, resolve our little local difficulty. So I wanted to say directly in front of all these people to David Kornstein, who is a very successful businessman, a philanthropist, a proud member of the Jewish community, um, a man who has uh, been an activist, an active member of the Republican Party in the state of New York for many years. I wanted to say to you that you are a friend in the house. And uh, when you have a friend in the house, you don't always agree with every single thing they have to say. But if you're a friend, you, you listen with friendship and respect. Um, and you have a frank, full exchange of views as friends. But I do want you to know personally that your friendship for us, for what we try to do, for what we represent, um, has been extremely important to us, David. So we welcome you to see you, <clears throat> and we await your words with interest. There will be questions afterwards. Uh, these questions uh, 
I'll say it now because I always say it later. A question is a short interrogative statement <laughs> followed by a question mark. Not a lot of people know this, but it's a, it's, a, it's a specific verbal form. Shorter the better, because there are a lot of people here, the shorter the better means the more there'll be. Real questions, and he's a man who doesn't, ask, doesn't duck a question. So, uh, Ambassador Kornstein, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, so Thank you. I don't introduce. Oh, I don't need this. Do I need this or not? Okay. Uh, thank you, Michael. I really appreciate that. Um, the topic for this afternoon is supposed to be uh, the American dream under President Trump, but I have a feeling, as Michael had said, that uh, there might be another subject of interest to you as well as what the American dream might be. So uh, he is correct. It was right after I unpacked my bags and found out where the office and the residence was that the next stop that I made was here at the university. <clears throat> and that was to show how important this subject isn't just to uh, the American ambassador, but to all of the American people as well. <clears throat> we do not have a perfect country in the United States, and one of the things that is far from perfect is the confirmation process that we go through uh, to become an ambassador, or as you just witnessed in the past few weeks, what goes on uh, to be a justice on the Supreme Court. It's a very similar process. Instead of the Judiciary Committee, <clears throat> you go before the Foreign Relations Committee. And I can tell you that I must have met at least 25 different senators, Republicans and Democrats. And <clears throat> the first question, the very first question that was asked by anyone was what is going to happen to Central University. So this is a subject, you're far away in Budapest here, but it's a subject that's very, very much on the minds of most people in the United States. <clears throat> we have other, other important things that we're talking about with the government and that are very, very important, such as having 80% of the energy in this co country coming from one source. We had that in America with the Middle East. It wasn't good for America. It's not good for Hungary to have all of its energy come from Russia. So there's subjects like that, and I've, I've expressed a lot of them of, of what I'm working on. But of my first 100 days that are he, uh, been here, I have spent more time on Central University than any other subject. That's how important it is to me and to the American people. <clears throat> I come from the business world. In the business world, until the check clears, you don't have a deal. <laughs> the check is not in the mail yet, forget clearing. And the, talk, the, the clock is ticking. There's a very, very important board meeting that's taking place on the 22nd of this month that isn't far from now. So what I have seen in government, whether it be the city of New York, the state of New York, or the federal government, or the government here in Hungary, deals tend to get done at the 11th hour and 59th minute. It makes it nerve-wracking, but unfortunately, that, that seems to be the universal process. Hopefully, we won't have to wait till that very end. And, uh, we are hopefully going to have a meeting very shortly representing the government and the university. And I hope to accomplish a great, I, I'll attend that meeting, and I hope to accomplish a lot at it. Um, it's not done, and in the deal business we say it's, uh, if you're cautiously optimistic, and the word is cautiously, 
Uh, that's about where I am at this point of the game. I wish I could tell you it was over. It's not over. I think we're close, and I hope it happens. I, can't, I can tell you I, I have not worked on anything with more time and effort of our government than this particular project. So we're rooting for you, we're doing what we can, and hopefully we get across the finish line with it. <clears throat> so now let me uh, talk about what I was supposed to talk about, which is uh, the American dream under President Trump. Um, I don't think that dream has changed if it were President Roosevelt, either one of them, or President Clinton, or President Trump. The American dream is really the same dream as it's always been. To have a happy, better life, uh, to have a good family, to have a job to provide for your family, and that hopefully your children will have uh, a better quality of life than uh, what you've experienced. So that has uh, been the dream, and it continues to be the dream. What I would rather speak to you about tonight, if it's acceptable, is really how do you get from here to there? How do you, what are the steps you need to achieve your dream? And whether you're a, a student in Detroit, Michigan in an auditorium, or in Rome, Italy, or in Tokyo, Japan, or sitting in this audience here, I think it's all the same. So let me relate a, a, a few points that happened to me that helped me get and achieve whatever limited success I've had in my career. I think the first thing that you need is you have to find two or three mentors in your life. I found three. Uh, my first mentor was my father and mother where they, with my mother, gave me the, the values that I think I have in life. And my father gave me the confidence that I could go forward and do whatever I can. Uh, your parents will be with you. I don't care if you're 55 or, or 65. They'll, you'll always be their child, and they'll always watch over you. At some point, that ends. And then if you could help yourself, and you could find someone, as I found this beautiful little girl that will be married 50 years next August together, uh, that helps you get from here to there. When I was in graduate school, there were two very, very strong retail companies, Sears and J.C. Penney. It's another lecture, but uh, it's a great example of looking in a graveyard and see how things can change and what happens to companies. But in the early 60s, J.C. Penney was a fabulous retail company. They did maybe eight or nine billion dollars in business, had say a thousand stores. <clears throat> and they felt that they could get another million dollars in revenue by attracting some service businesses. Service business meaning watch repair, optical departments, restaurants, automotive centers, various services. And they weren't going to operate them. They would look for various licensees to come in and operate those departments. So I was in a very academic mode. I was uh, getting my MBA at NYU. And uh, I made an appointment with the man in charge of finding these people. And I made a presentation to him where I calculated if I would have taken in one watch per month per store, in about a year and a half, I'd be a millionaire and retire. So I went in, and at the end of the presentation, he looked at me and said, who else do you do this for? <laughs> and I said to him, don't you worry about that. I'm going to take care of the penny company. That's all you need to know. And he looked at me, he laughed, and he said, we really don't need you for this. But we hit it off well. And uh, he said, we're going to do business one day. He called me back and about a month later and said, how would you like to go into the fine jewelry business? I said, I was never in a jewelry store. He said, I'll give you the name J.C. Penney. You try it. 
and I think you'll be good at it, and uh, why don't you try it? So I went out and negotiated a lease with the store manager, and uh, my mother and father, God rest their souls, gave me their life savings, <clears throat> and we opened the store. And the, maybe they figured we'd do $100,000 the first year, and we wound up doing 500000 So they were thrilled, and they said, now we want you to open a big store. And that was a success, too. So they came and said, well, now we'd like you to open 100 stores. Uh, we didn't have the money for the second store, let alone to open 100 stores. And that opened the door for a lot of other companies to come in and do what we did. What's interesting with this little story is that that philosophy of how we conducted the business. I went to the vendor community and I said, look, I'm not going to lie to you. I haven't got the money to pay for the goods, but I want you to give us that merchandise on consignment. And uh, they had pity, I guess, on this young kid and they, they gave me the goods. And we continued that philosophy as long as I had the company. And to make a long story short, 40 years later, that one store turned into 1,200 stores, and we were doing well over a billion and a half dollars when I retired 20 years ago. Billion and a half dollars 20 years ago was, was a good day's pay, you might think. So the philosophy we continued was that we kept all the goods on consignment, and uh, we had about $800 million on consignment at the end when, when I left the company. So the man that got me into J.C. Penney was my second mentor. He showed me how to work in a big company, how to exist in a bureaucracy. It was a great lesson to me. The third mentor I had was maybe 15 or 17 years after I was in business, and I got a phone call from a man named Harold Janine. Harold Janine would be the equivalent of Warren Buffett today. He was the leading businessman of his time. He was the chairman of IT&T, and just a brilliant, wonderful man. And he called me up and asked me to come to his office. He had retired from IT&T, had an office in the Waldorf Astoria. And I remember when I walked into his anteroom, there were pictures of him in the Oval Office with Truman through Reagan, who was then the president, and trying to figure out what the hell am I doing here. And he came out, he handed me an annual report of a New York Stock Exchange company by the name of Seligman and Latz. He said, I'd like to buy this company take it private, you and I will be partners, and you'll run the company. And I turned around and said, I, I, I can't tell you right now what the company would be, so that's fine, you give me a three to five year projection of where you think it could go. And I had the knowledge of some people and knew some folks that were highly, highly successful business people. I called each one of them and uh, I said, what do you think of this idea? Because he wanted to take it private and we would go forward with the company. Everybody I spoke to, really very, very successful people, they all said, don't do it. How many houses are you gonna have? How many stakes can you have? You have a good life, this guy is gonna kill your life and ruin everything that you have. Stay with what you have. And needless to say, I, I didn't take that advice. Uh, I couldn't walk away from the challenge of doing it. And that's the second point I want to give you of how you get from here to there. In my opinion, probably 90% of you in this room no matter what you do in life, if you're going to be a professor, if you're going to be a lawyer, if you're going to work in government, uh, anything you do, at some point in your career, you're going to have an opportunity to bet the house. Very, very risky. I had to take the company that I had built for almost 20 years and throw it into the pot and give it up 
to take a risk on going into a company that was 10 times the size of mine with three other divisions in it. Pretty risky thing to do. Most people don't take that risk. Most people protect their family. I have two kids, I got this, I have a nice job. I don't know if I want to do that. If you have confidence in yourself that you can do something more than what you're doing at that time, my advice to you is go after it. That's part of the American dream. That should be part of your dream of getting from here to there. And the last point that maybe I would make of how you go down that road is that when I was sitting as a student where a lot of you are now, I guarantee you nobody, no one, thought that I'm the most likely to succeed. Wasn't, wasn't going to happen. I had, I don't know if they still have this term, but I had, I was a gentleman C student, um, an average student. I got by, I went to a good school, I went to a good college, I have a nice graduate degree, uh, but I was, I was an average student. Nobody would have picked me to have the career that I wound up doing. So at that point when I was where you are, uh, I really didn't know. I, think, I thought I wa wanted to go into business, but I didn't know where, how, what. That's normal. And where you are when you're 20 years down the road from now, that can change again. The main thing is that whether you're 40, whether you're 60, or whether you are, as I am, 80, you can have a whole new career. I became a diplomat. Who the hell would have figured that? I became a <laughs> diplomat. I, I represent the President of the United States of America. Whether you like him or hate him, that's who I represent, that office. I speak for 330 million Americans. How can that happen to me at this stage of my life? So you still have life. That dream continues. It doesn't end when you graduate. It doesn't end when you're 50. It doesn't end when you're 80. I'm an example of that. So go live your dreams. That's my advice to you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Why don't you have a seat? Uh, and we'll have some questions. Okay. I thought what we do to get this started um, is I would ask one question to set a sterling example of what a question actually is, and then I thought Reinhardt might have a question as well, and then we'd get it started and then go out to the audience. So you've told an extraordinary story of success in America. It's your story. So the question is, as, as you look at America now, do you think that dream has slipped out of reach just for millions and millions of Americans? Do you worry as a patriot, as a guy who loves his country, that the story you've just told is a story that is just out of reach for a lot of Americans? Great question. I, uh, I absolutely think that there is probably more, I wish the hell I was 20, 25 years old today. I think there are such opportunities today, Michael. Uh, tremendous opportunities. It's such a changing world. What technology is doing in every sector. But you have to, you have to be sharp. Mm -hmm. You have to try to envision where you would like to go and which fields you'd like to go into. But I don't think there's any less opportunity to th today than there ever was, not only in America, but here. Look what's going on here in Budapest. I went yesterday <clears throat> to uh, BlackRock. I think they just opened uh, not a month or two months ago. All young, young people. All the problems from around the world that companies are looking at they're sending here. 
They're sending to this city, to this country, to go figure out. And the people that are working there, they're making a terrific living. But more importantly, they're intellectually challenged. Mm -hmm. So they're really enjoying what they're doing. And they have a, they're not going to stay there for long because that field is, is a five year and out deal. <laughs> but then they'll go somewhere else. And, and they have fabulous futures ahead of them. Mm -hmm. So I think there's great opportunity, fabulous opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, uh, Ambassador, you talked about your personal pursuit of happiness as it is laid down in the Constitution of the United States. And you mentioned also that you are now a diplomat. So yeah. I have to ask you about <laughs> diplomacy, of All course. Right. I'm not that good at that. Yeah, yet. well, yeah, but, but you are. You, you proudly presented yourself uh, in this Give me a in this, business in this, question. In this, category, <laughs> in this category. So there was another president uh, about 100 years ago, Woodrow Wilson, who yeah. also talked about America first uh, when he wanted to uh, use this as a motto for U.S. neutrality uh, during the First World War. But he also mentioned, and I have a quote here, he said, America first should not be understood in a selfish spirit yet should present sympathy for mankind. And we wonder, of course, whether this is still true under President Trump and mm -hmm. America First. Mm -hmm. uh, I know our president, I lose track of time, 25, 30 years. Um, he's a family man. He's a, he's a guy that, uh, that cares. He cares about... He cares about the man on the street. Yeah, and I think that's what resident, resonated excuse me, with the American people, that they found that, that he does care about them. Um, he also feels that there's nothing wrong with saying, I care about my country first, but I live in a world. I live in a world with other nations, with, with other people. Uh, I, I, I'm not isolated alone. And uh, I, I think that, that he would agree with what Wilson said. I think, I think they're of a similar point of view.